Hello everyone and thank you for attending today's webinar, How to Use Save DBSD Patterns in Specific Applications. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a couple of housekeeping issues. At the bottom of your console are several application widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can click on the Q&A widget to enter and submit them. We'll try to answer these during the webinar, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, you'll receive an answer later via email. A copy of today's slide deck and some uh, links to additional materials are available in the resource list widget that looks like a green folder. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. Finally, an on-demand version of the webcast will be available shortly after this live session, and it can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Now I'd like to introduce Matt Nowell, who's our presenter for today's webinar. Matt is the EBSD product manager at EDAX, and he has a passion for EBSD and microstructural characterization. Matt joined TechSEM Labs when he graduated from the University of Utah in 1995 with a degree in material science and engineering. At TSL, he was part of the team that pioneered the development and commercialization of EBSD and OIN. After uh, EDAX acquired TSL in 1999, he joined the applications group to help continue to develop EBSD as a technique and integrate structural information with chemical information collected using EDS. Within EDAX, Matt has been involved in a number of roles, including product management, business development, customer and technical support, engineering and application support and development. In his spare time, Matt enjoys playing golf and pondering if changing the texture of his clubs will affect his final score. And now over to you, Matt. Thanks, Sue, for that nice introduction. And we, we were joking that maybe we need to come up with a new joke for next year's uh, biography, but we'll tackle that for next year's webinars. So um, welcome, everyone, to this webinar. Um, the, uh, the mental title I had when I put this together is, you know, why should we save EBSD patterns? What can we use them for? So my goal for this presentation is to be able to show you, one, how you can save the EBSD pattern so you can usefully do it, and then show some of the things you can do once you've saved these patterns that, that can bring value to your uh, microanalysis. And as part of this, of course, I need to acknowledge uh, some coworkers and collaborators. It's always uh, work that's uh, done as, as a combined effort. So uh, Stuart Wright, Renee Clo, Sean Wallace, Tara Nilees, and Scott uh, Lindemann here from EDAX. Uh, and Mark DeGraff and Ferangus Ram from uh, Carnegie Mellon University have all uh, contributed to part of this work that I'm going to show today. So if I take that initial idea of saying, why should we save uh, EBSD patterns, really I think the, it's the inverse of that that's a key question, and it's to say, well, why don't we save EBSD patterns? What's the downside uh, to that sort of an approach? And so the answer, of course, to that is it's just a matter of file sizes and storage. So um, if we look at how large files can be, if we just save our orientation data only in our OSC file format, uh, it's about 750 kilobytes per 10,000 measurements to store that data. Um, if we store that data plus the HuffPeak data, which we'll explain exactly what that is, but it's essentially where the bands are uh, for each point, for each pattern uh, in a data set, uh, it's about two megabytes, so it's you know, just a little under three times larger than just the orientation data. And so when we start saving patterns, um, file sizes just start to get larger. So we have different file formats I wanted to discuss. Uh, so if we look at a 96 by 96 pixel image, uh, which is kind of typical for uh, basic um, you know, cubic type materials, um, the, the default file format we currently recommend is what we call the UP2 or UP2 pattern file. It's a 16-bit file that's uncompressed, uh, and that file size would be about 180 megabytes. So it's about 240 times the size of just the orientation data. Uh, we can also do the, uh, the UP1 pattern file, which is 8-bit uh, uncompressed. 
Um, for general re-indexing, that's probably just fine, but for things uh, like HR, EBSD, where you might want more data depth, um, you, I'd still probably recommend the 16-bit, but it's smaller. It's about half that size, about uh, 90 megabytes. We also have a file format we call the pat, file, pattern file, which is a 32-bit uh, individually compressed format. Uh, and so there the trade-off is it's a larger bit depth, but it's compressed, so it's a little bit slower. And it's, it's on the relative same size as the UP2. Um, and so uh, for um, something like HR eBSD, where we want higher pixel resolution patterns, uh, 480 by 480 pixels, with the UP2 format, that jumps up to 4.5 gigabytes per 10,000 points. So it's about 6,000 times larger. So the key message is, as you save patterns, you're using more file space. Um, of course, fortunately for us, uh, the cost of storage has decreased over time. You can see that in this little graph I stole from a website. And there are larger capacity drives that are becoming available. So there are eight terabyte drives that are, that are uh, pretty reasonable to get. So really the main downside to saving all of it is just have to keep that data somewhere um, and, it, and it can start adding up if you're talking about millions of data points. That being said, I'm now going to show you how to do it and then show you why uh, it will be useful. So I want to start in the team acquisition software. So um, when, you, when you run team, we've set up a map here. So we're in the mapping mode. Uh, we're in the collect map mode. There's a, a, a button on the toolbar, that center toolbar um, top that's highlighted in red, which it, uh, accesses the advanced properties panel. That property is the panel that appears on the right-hand side of the user interface. And in there, there's the eBSD mapping section. And if you look in there, there are a number of options there. And one of the options there is the one that allows you to click on to say, save the patterns. Uh, this is also where you can uh, select which pattern file format you want to use with the UP2 format as the default. So that's, that's pretty easy to do. So at the same time you're setting up your area and your step size and whatever you want to do, you can, you can save patterns from that uh, location. Once you've collected the data, um, we can also think about reviewing the patterns uh, in the team software. So once we've collected a data set and you click on it, it brings us to the review data mode. Uh, and you're able here to come in and select uh, points uh, to open. Um, when you do this, you can select just a point. You can also use what's called NPAR, which I'll describe later, uh, to be applied on a single point. And then once this point is, is brought up, you can then export it, uh, again, out as a pattern file or as an individual pattern. When we look at a single point, we're then able to use the full capacity of the indexing engine. So we can look at the indexing. We can look and say, uh, how's the, the band matching going? How's our triplet indexing and our voting working? Uh, and we can adjust things. So if we need to adjust uh, our huff parameters, our indexing parameters, those can be adjusted at this point. We'll discuss that a little bit further. We can also add different phases. If we run across a phase that we weren't expecting, we didn't have loaded during the initial acquisition, we could then uh, put that in index and see if we are now getting a better match and then can uh, apply that to that particular pattern and then to the particular data set. And then once we have this, we, we've collected this, of course, on the microscope. Um, the saved pattern files can be used both in the team software and also in the OIM analysis uh, version 8 software. And so you have the option of saying, do I want to use it on my microscope computer or do I want to use it on my remote computer, my remote analysis computer? And so when you do this, you can think about how do I want to move these files from my acquisition computer to another computer? Uh, and there are really two different approaches to use. Um, you can see on the, the first image there on the left, when we're, when we're interacting with our data on the project tree, uh, we can select a data set. Uh, and from there, we can say we want to now export this from the team software so we can move it over. So if we want to uh, move something to work with a, a, a remote team software, we use this portable database project. Uh, and so when we hit the export button, uh, there's a little checkbox there that says create portable database project. When we use this approach, we have to actively select to include the pattern files. There's another little checkbox in there, and that will create a, a project container that includes both the orientation data and the patterns. 
if we don't want to worry about a project, if we just want to export OSC files and pattern files, we turn off the portable database project option, and it's just going to export the two file names uh, into a folder, one an OSC, one the pattern file with the selected pattern format, so a UP2 or a PAT format, whatever you had selected. It's important to know when we're opening these OSC files in OIM analysis, uh, it associates a pattern file with the OSC file by having the same uh, name before the file extension. Now, uh, on the flip side, uh, if you're using OIM data collection to collect data, um, the same functionality to save patterns are, are available. Um, the, this is a screenshot here where in our scan properties window, uh, generally set up all your scan details on the scan tab. There's also a patterns tab here and towards the bottom, there's the save patterns region where you can select save all the patterns and again select the image format. So here I'm just showing selecting the UP2 files. You also have the option of selecting the other formats or save them as individual patterns. Uh, generally, the reason we like using a pattern file rather than individual patterns is that if you're getting thousands and thousands of images within a single folder, trying to manage and move those via a Windows file structure can be quite cumbersome for Windows. I don't know if it's indexing or whatever it does, but it can be a lot slower to open and copy. So generally having a single pattern file makes things a little more uh, convenient to manipulate and move. Once we have these patterns, uh, we can bring them into OIM analysis. So when we uh, open the OSC file, if in that same directory there's a, a, a same file name with a pattern format extension, it will realize to say these two are associated and will show in the scan summary that patterns are available. So there on the, on the image there in that red box, it shows it says there's patterns available from that particular file name. Uh, so then you're able to um, do functions that are tied to having saved patterns available. And so once we have those patterns, now we're at a point of saying, what are some of the things we can, we can do with these patterns and, and what might make it interesting? Um, the first thing I want to show is what we call FlexiView. And so FlexiView is a feature in OIM analysis that allows for uh, sort of a, a, a flyby or dynamic review of things or also a static review where we select specific points. And of those, we can look at what the unit cell looks like at a particular point for a given orientation a pole figure representation of that orientation, uh, reconstructed EBSD patterns, which I'll, I'll show an example of here in just a second, and then save EBSD patterns. And so you get through, you get access through this through the FlexiView tab. So anytime you create a map in OIM analysis, there, uh, there's a map and then to the side or the bottom, there's a, 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 a dialog window and a set of tabs that allow you to do your interactive analysis, your summary, your notes. One of those options is also for FlexiView. So that's shown there in that little red box in the image. Uh, and once you have that, you have the option to add and, and remove um, the different FlexiView options. So in this case, I'm adding uh, different static options for these the unit cell and pole figures and patterns. And when I do that, and I then go click on a point in the map, it shows it shows area one there that I've clicked. And now for that point, it shows those four representations. So on the on the representations there on the bottom left shows the reconstructed pattern. Um, that's the pattern based on the peaks detected with the Huff transform. And to the right there, the bottom right, we see the actual saved pattern. And you can see the correlation between the reconstructed and the saved. And basically that's why the indexing works. We're finding the bands that actually occur in the pattern. And so this is the static review with FlexiView. You can also do a dynamic review, which is harder to show in a, in a webinar and a PowerPoint, but as you move your cursor uh, throughout the image, those images would now dynamically change. And with the FlexiView, we can also add more than one uh, static review. So here I've clicked another point here. So the most recent point, the number changes. You can see I've gone across a twin boundary. Uh, the number says one now within that, that uh, twin grain. Uh, and the um, the display for that point is changed. But within there, if I want to now compare point one and two, I can adjust and configure my window to say I want to show the reconstructed and save patterns from points one and two. And so the um, the review space and flexibility space is fully configurable. I don't I'm not limited to two or three points. I can fill it with 
uh, as many as I want to be able to show, you know, how do these different outputs change in different points of my structure. So if you're looking at, in this case, a twin boundary, we can see sort of uh, how that bottom left or bottom right pole uh, position is constant, and we're we're rotating about that for the twin axis. Um, you could look at, at phase relationships and things, epitaxial growth. You, you'd be able to, to visualize this and also see it, of course, with a unit cell and a pole figure. So it's a nice way to sort of interact with the data and visualize what's happening both microstructurally and with um, the pattern uh, and orientation information. So it's important to note that um, when we have this data, we have the option, of course, to export it out of volume analysis. We try to make the data analysis. We can we can bring lots of things in. We can also send it out uh, different ways so you can you can manipulate it as as you see fit. And so if you right click on the data set, so on on the image here, we're on the OIM analysis project tree. I'm right clicking on the data set name, which is sort of the top level of a project. And when I right click, it brings up a menu. And I can go down here into uh, Project, Export, uh, and then I can select patterns to export specific patterns. When I do this, I can select the format if I want to do another pattern file, if I want to still, uh, just export uh, individual patterns. I also have the option of, of turning on our NPAR processing or if I want to turn on different background processing. And again, we'll talk about both of those, but they're available as part of the export process. The other thing that's available is exporting patterns to what's called an HDF5 format. HDF5 is a discoverable, discoverable container file format that uh, can be used by third-party applications. Uh, so another uh, number of groups are developing HDF5 compatibility. Um, you can actually go download HDF5 readers. So if you save it to an HDF5 format, you can read it externally and access the data uh, for your own use. Um, the trick to doing this is when we when we do this, it's not done through exporting patterns. We actually export it as the scan data. And as we export the scan data, one of the, the output types is the HDF5 format. And so that exports both the scan data plus the pattern files in an associated container. So it's, a, it's sort of bundled and easily accessible. Now, kind of stepping uh, to the next part, I wanted to show a little bit of a uh, of a of a real life type of example of, of where this is, would be sort of useful and why we want to go through the trouble of having these patterns available. So this is just an example from a, a mineral sample um, that we're looking at a, a standard backscattered uh, image in, in the SEM, and of course our, our backscattered image. Uh, can generally show what I call a first level phase contrast imaging. We see backscattered intensity varies as a function of the average atomic number. So the, the brighter that it is, generally the higher the average atomic number. So there's some phase contrast. Um, why that's important for us from an EBSD perspective is that if we think about um, the, the backscattered intensity uh, coming, creating the EBSD patterns, the scattering intensity is a function uh, of the atomic number. And so the, the higher the uh, average atomic number of a, of a sample, the stronger the, uh, the backscattered coefficient. So this is just a little, this equation just show, kind of shows the parameter that's important. I'm not going to go through and try to, try to explain it other than basically to show on this curve that as the uh, atomic number goes up, so you can see we start with Z equals 12 going to Z to, to 79. As that increases, our intensity also increases. So the higher the atomic number, uh, generally the more signal you get. That's why oftentimes you'll see, you know, uh, for um, higher atomic numbers, platinum, tungsten, uh, give stronger signals than something like, you know, uh, aluminum or magnesium. And so this is just an example from aluminum and tantalum showing uh, how the intensity changes without any background correction. Uh, we, we get a brighter signal from tantalum. So why that's important for us from an EBSD perspective is, is a few reasons. The first is recognizing that when we get a signal on the EBSD detector, the intensity uh, on the on the the screen and the position of the intensity 
is giving us more information than we have. So if we generally think about what we extract from EBSD, we get the diffraction information to figure out orientation phase. But the, the intensity uh, and distribution of that intensity gives us some idea of uh, what the composition is, surface condition, specimen tilt, um, relative beam current. And so traditionally, we've only used a small part of this information. Uh, and one of the things we asked ourselves a few years ago is to say, how can we use this additional information um, in a useful way? And are we able to, to take some of this contrast information that's hitting our phosphor screen and, and apply it usefully? And of course, um, the answer we hope is yes. And so that goes to uh, what we call our Prius or Pattern Region of Interest Analysis System. And this is just the idea that in our in our standard geometry we, we're tilted to 70 something degrees, so our backscattered intensity is of course going towards our EBSD detector and away from our backscatter detector, uh, and so we have a forward scatter detector uh, mounted around there, but most of our signal is, is um, headed towards the EBSD detector. And if we look at an EBSD pattern, we of course get a signal on the diffraction a diffraction signal on the phosphor screen. Uh, that has some spatially specific information. So if we take our, our pattern area and we just subdivide it into different regions of interest, um, in this case it's a 5 by 5 grid to create 25 different virtual apertures or virtual detectors. As we then raster the beam across our sample surface, we can monitor the signal flux in each ROI as we move the beam and use that to reconstruct an image that looks something like this. So for each one of those uh, uh, 25 ROIs, the change in intensity as we move the beam across the surface gives us a different image. So it's very similar to um, to just standard even backscattered imaging where you'd have your you know four plus detectors and you're, you're monitoring the signal on each one of those. This gives us 25 different detector regions and each one will give us a different signal with different contrasts. And so this is an example from a deformed material. So we see different levels of deformation uh, contrast. This is a sample that has multi-phase and some topography. So generally what we see is towards the top, we see more atomic number contrast. In the middle, we see more orientation contrast. And towards the bottom, where we're closer to the, the projection of the surface, we see more uh, topographical contrast. And so we call that uh, Prius imaging. And so besides just using it as an imaging tool, though, there are two other modes that are important. One is we call Prius collection. Um, I'm going to talk about this just because it happens in the background. And then there's also what we call Prius analysis. And this is Prius analysis where we can work on the saved EBSD pattern. And that's why I wanted to talk about it in this, this webinar, where we can define the size and positions of these different uh, apertures or different virtual detectors to create different contrasts. Uh, images. So this just shows the Prius collection images. Again, these are three predefined regions on the top, middle, and bottom. Um, generally, they, they give us the orientation, uh, chemical phase, and topography contrast. With Prius like this, the nice thing to realize is there's also direct correlation between the um, where we're generating the signal and the orientation data. So we're getting uh, higher spatial resolution phase contrast imaging directly associated with that point. So we, we get a, a finer spatial resolution channel available uh, with phase contrast signal. And so this is just an example that, uh, that we like to show. This is a piece of corroded steel, where if we look on the right there, that's the bottom uh, detector. And we see some strong topographical contrast. In the center of the detector, we see orientation contrast. You see the grains that are occurring in the bulk of the steel sample. And then towards the top, we see some, uh, some phase contrast. So you can see some regions there that have a varying uh, intensity signal uh, from the detector. So we get these three contrasts just sort of automatically. With Prius analysis, this is where we're going to start accessing those saved EBSD patterns. So this is just a, a screenshot showing the window. So uh, on the right is my scan area, and I've then clicked on a point in there. When I click on a point on the left-hand window, I see the pattern associated uh, with that point. So again, dynamically, I could click around and see the different patterns. And in the mode here, 
uh, I'm using the 3x3 three three preset ROI. So basically, um, there are nine different uh, channels available. There are sliders that control the width and the height of the different sliders. So as I adjust that, you know, as I make my, um, my window smaller, I get less intensity, but I'm more sensitive to small changes. But so I can adjust that. And when I then create an image, I create a, uh, an image from each of those nine detectors that I can then go click on and adjust. Um, from this, we're also able to do our, uh, our po pattern processing if we want to do things like additional background subtraction, if we want to do NPAR. Uh, in this case, we have a, an auto contrast brightness going on on the image, and we can weight the, the different uh, images together and combine them or color them to create an image. And so this allows us to really uh, set the, uh, the size and discrimination of these filters to sort of maximize the contrast we want to find. So this is just a little example. Um, you can see here uh, I'm selecting this on the pattern image, the bottom right quadrant. And I've sort of adjusted the sliders so that uh, within that region that the uh, that pole, that strong 110 pole, is sort of within that uh, that window, that the, the lined aperture region. So when I create a map based on that image, this, this twin grain on the right, the interior, the twin that we were looking at earlier, um, is now brighter from that particular area from where I've selected the aperture. So it's very dynamic, and it, it, as I adjust things here, the images change. And then we can go away from having this, the fixed sizes. We can then go uh, create fully flexible uh, ROI. So here I've just created three, a uh, small little square, a, a vertically oriented rectangle and a horizontally oriented rectangle, created three images based on that. Um, so once we have the same patterns, you can draw these ROIs basically in any in any uh, area or region you're interested in to create a, a representative pattern. So you can think about associating it with a, a pole in the pattern or associating it with a diffraction band in the pattern to see the contrast associated with those specific crystallographic uh, features. This is just an example using Prius analysis uh, where I've put a small little uh, window here, smaller than our typical size. This generally gives us uh, stronger uh, orientation change contrast, um, so we get a nice image. And then one example I've liked to shown, this is, a, again, a piece of, um, uh, a, I don't remember if it's, I think I want to say it's aluminum, but I'm not entirely sure uh, if I'm remembering that right. But if I look at my three general images, the top, the middle, and the bottom, in all three cases I see the orientation contrast, but I also see some of the surface topography on, on, the, on the sample. And so what we wanted to do is to say, can we isolate the orientation contrast from the topographical contrast and then just pick out the one we want? So in this case, we drew a, a, um, a, a long, thin, vertical band within the pattern. We created an image based on that ROI. And then we get just orientation contrast, and it suppresses the topographical contrast to get an orientation contrast channeling that. And so that's Prius. So coming back to our multi-phase sample, our Prius, our upper detector image, shows a similar atomic number contrast than we see with the backscatter detector. And again, we get one-to-one -one correlation with our Prius contrast as we do with our EBSD orientation uh, and then also simultaneous EDS information. They're all being collected from the same point. Uh, and that allows us some additional correlation of our, of our Prius imaging and our, our uh, orientation measurements and also with saved pattern uh, functionality. So within OIM analysis, we can access saved patterns through the highlighting toolbar. Um, there's a little button on there that looks like a, a, a representation of a Kikuchi pattern. When we highlight there, the tooltip says re-index points. So if I select that function and then I click on any point within the EBSD map, it will then open that EBSD, matter, uh, open that EBSD pattern associated with that point. And so we get a user interface that looks something like this. Uh, so it brings up the pattern uh, from that area. And there are three um, primary user control uh, functions available for in that pattern. Um, the first one uh, labeled on the red diagram there is number one. 
uh, is the pattern indexing controls. So this looks pretty similar to what we saw in the team pattern window. This is where we can tell it to index. Uh, this is where we can toggle this, the overlay. This is where we can uh, go from manual band detection to the huff band detection. We can interrogate different bands in the material to see if they should be activated or not. Um, that's just how we interact with the indexing. The um, the section two, the re-indexing control is shown there in the blue. Uh, this is where we re-index. So when we talk about we're going to take a pattern and we're going to recalculate the orientation and or phase. Uh, and so we can re-index on a point level, a partition level, or a data set level. And we'll, we'll talk about that. And it's also in these re-indexing controls where we access what we call our chi-scan functionality. And then over on the third window, the, the most important really for this part of the webinar is this is where the different settings are that allow us to uh, adjust what we're doing for a specific pattern. So I wanted to go through some of these settings to show some of the things we're going to be able to do with these saved patterns. So if we think about an EBSD pattern, oh, sorry. Right there's where I want to be. I clicked one too many. So when we think about an EBSD pattern, generally our incident pattern uh, is, is what we see here, uh, or what we call our live pattern. It has a strong intensity gradient kind of from the center-ish of the pattern out radially. The, the signal level goes down. That's just due to the inherent nature of the diffraction in the background. So generally we do uh, some sort of background correction to flat field the image and improve band detection. So in our image processing window here, we have a number of different uh, background processing tools available. So the first is we have our data set background correction. So we can take all the saved DBSD patterns uh, and create a background from all those patterns, and then we can subtract that, uh, or we can also divide it. We'll, we'll go through those options. And this is really similar to what we can do in the general team uh, data collection process. Where it starts to be different and, and has some uh, good applications is we can also uh, create a background based on the partition. And so what that means is if we take our entire data, we can break our data into different subsets or partitions. And when we think about our data, is one of the default partitions we have is we have phase-based partitions. And so what we're able to do then is basically create a background based on the different phases of the material. Of course, this is useful as we saw that when our scattering uh, changes because of the phase change, the intensity and position changes. Uh, a single background is no longer perfect for a given phase. This allows us to create a, a better background for each phase of the material, which creates a better background subtraction and hopefully leads to a little bit better band detection. So if you have materials where you have uh, a strong atomic number contrast, and one of the classical ones would be the, the synthetic diamond applications where you have you know, a, a low Z number carbon based diamond grain, and then something like a, a, a tungsten carbide that's much higher average atomic number. Uh, getting the background subtraction to work well with that is, is, is a little tricky, but if we create a, a, a background based on each phase, it then becomes very easy to do that. Um, there's also, I mentioned, you know, we do a subtraction, but there's there's the uh, advanced button that allows us to bring up what we call our full image processing toolbox. It's the same toolbox that's available in Teams, so there's a, a button here that brings that up. And we press that up. This is where we can select if we want to do uh, background subtraction or division, if we want to do that in a static mode or in a dynamic mode. We also have the option then to use saved background images if you want to use a saved one. That's sometimes useful if you're looking at a single crystal and you want to bring in a background you've collected under similar conditions. Um, we also have other filters, mean, median, common type filters for, for processing the patterns, uh, high and low pass filters uh, for, for filtering out noise, some normalization functions. And for all these background recipes, you have the ability to save them, to load them, to share them. And as we do this, it also tells you how much the calculation time is, so you have an idea to say, hey, you know, I want to optimize this. Um, you know, we don't want to do 15 seconds of image processing if I can get the same results in, you know, half a second or whatever, whatever the numbers are. The other button that's interesting here is the one that allows us to do our NPAR processing. Uh, it can be done through the image processing. So I wanted to talk a little bit about NPAR. So NPAR is a, is a function we have that improves the signal-to-noise ratio through spatial pattern averaging. 
So if we look at these two patterns, there's one before NPAR, here's one from after. You can see that there's there's less noise after NPAR. Uh, and ideally, this helps improve band detection and therefore indexing performance. So to just sort of uh, introduce NPAR, uh, if you think about how we collect eBSD maps, we're collecting data on some sort of a sampling grid. Uh, our default grid is a hexagonal grid, so each neighbor has six equidistant neighbors. Um, of course, for EBSD, our, uh, our traditional indexing relies on finding the position of the bands with our Huff transform. Uh, and as our, as our patterns become noisier, um, it becomes harder and harder to find those bands. And so this just shows an example uh, as we push uh, our, our system to the limits, and that can be done either through making the camera run faster, running at lower beam corners, running at lower voltages, whatever we do, uh, at some point the noise level on our camera increases, and so the indexing performance here shown on the uh, vertical axis of this graph uh, starts to, to, to decrease as we increase noise on the horizontal graph. And so we know this is material dependent. This, this chart here shows four different materials. Uh, that the, the drop-off occurs at different noise levels and the drop-off, the amount of drop-off changes. But really the question is, as this performance starts to drop off, is there something we can do? And this is where was one of the driving forces for developing this MPAR processing is to try to, to make this better. So uh, traditionally we've addressed um, signal to noise through uh, frame averaging. The drawback, of course, of frame averaging is that it's slower. If I average 10 frames, the collection is 10 times slower. And so that's if you're if you're trying to do things quickly, if you're trying to avoid drift and contamination, you don't necessarily want to slow it down. And so with NPAR, the idea is we could take a point and then average it with its nearest neighbors. So in this case, we're averaging seven patterns from the six nearest neighbors, which improves the signal to noise. And if we then compare that to the results from a map. Um, this is from uh, this is just our, our uh, nickel super alloy test alloy. Um, the traditional indexing there on the left, we get about 11% indexing success. So we're uh, we're successfully indexing about 11% of the points. We run that through the MPAR uh, processing filter, and that jumps up to about 96% indexing. So a very clear, strong improvement. So when we started this, we got we got very excited. So we, we uh, sort of systematically started looking at this, um, and so we added more and more noise to the, the images uh, and compared traditional indexing with NPAR indexing and saw significant improvements uh, at, at different noise levels. So if we summarize that in a table, we can see uh, you know how our conventional indexing started dropping down. Our NPAR indexing kept things close to, you know, close to our 100% indexing success uh, with increased noise levels. And so what that allows us to do is as noise increases, our indexing stays the same. So we can start thinking about things, things like faster acquisition to lower beam currents, uh, better performance on, on um, lower atomic number samples because the signal to noise will increase higher with those, and um, lower beam currents for things that are like charging. So this is just an example uh, from a ceramic sample that at 20 kV, 5 nanoamps of beam current on the left, you can see the uh, the charging distortion that occurs. It just can't handle um, that uh, that beam dose. And if I run the same sample in area at 12 kV and one and a half nanoamps, then I get a nice uh, a nice structure. And so um, what that allows us to do is basically we can collect at the same speed and then process it offline to get um, you know better final data. Now, I mentioned that really the key, of course, to all this is being able to find the, um, the bands with the Huff transform. Uh, that's, the, that's what makes indexing work. If we, if we find the bands, we generally can index. If we don't find the bands, we don't index. And so now with saved patterns, what we're able to think about doing is, again, we can adjust the Huff parameters for each data set. Uh, we can also adjust it for each phase within a data set. And so that allows us to sort of optimize indexing per phase uh, for the best this indexing. So this is one of our options. Um, note that if we don't save patterns, it's still possible to re-index data. You can see here this is clicking on a point, and I see the reconstructed patterns. 
some of our indexing and phase parameters can be changed, but we obviously can't change our band detection uh, because that's what we're saving is what's detected. But we can still do some amount of this re-indexing without saved patterns. Just as a, as a very quick review of what the Huff transform is, um, basically it's, it's similar to a FOIA transform where we're transforming uh, X, Y space into rho theta space. So if we think about any point in X, Y space sort of shown here um, in this, um, this point here in the bottom left part of the diagram, for any point, there's an infinite amount of lines that go through that point that are defined by a rho theta value. And so um, the, the, the theta defines the uh, angle uh, normal to that line, and, and uh, the, the row value is the length of that vector going to the line. So for any point, we get a curve that looks like the curve on the right-hand side of that image. So that's, that's what a single point does. And so if we think about a line, any line can, of course, be thought of as a, a set of points. So if we look at four different points along this line here, we know each point has a set of curves, uh, and those co curves converge into a single point in the Huff space shown on the right. And so that's essentially what we're trying to do with this Huff transform problem is, is change a line-finding problem in XY space into a, a point-finding problem in Huff space. And so when we look at this uh, with the Huff, there's a number of things we, we can adjust to try to make this, this point finding uh, more effective. And so when we look at our user interface here on the right, at the bottom right here shows the Huff space for the given image. And you can see the different bright areas. And some of them have the black areas showing those are the bands that have been detected. And that's what we're trying to do is make sure we find the brightest lines uh, on the pattern with our Huff transform. So there's another a number of parameters we can adjust with the Huff. And I just wanted to go over some of the most common ones and why we'd want to adjust them. So the first one shown here is the, the pattern size that we're analyzing. Uh, that's how many pixels we want to pass through the Huff transform. So typically, um, the patterns you know, we're going to look at, we'll want to look at 120, 96, or 80 pixels. And so Generally, the smaller that number goes, the faster our processing. We're looking at a smaller, you know, Huff array. Um, it's pretty easy as a first level approximation to start thinking about we can match our pattern size to the incoming uh, size from the EBSD detector. And so um, where that starts to break down, of course, if we're looking at really high uh, values, generally the, the maximum we use is 250 for, for the Huff just from a, a time consideration. Um, and so usually what I tell people is to say, if, I, if I'm bringing in a, a 96 pixel image, start setting your Huff resolution at 96 pixels. It's, it's a good starting point. Um, really, when we talk about adjusting all these Huff parameters, the big thing I'd like to emphasize is what you want to do is monitor your indexing uh, output variables to determine what's working best. So you can look at your number of votes, you can look at your fit, you can look at your confidence index and say, hey, if I look at this at 120 pixels or 80 pixels, which of those is better or is it? does it make any difference? Oftentimes, you'll get the exact same result, and so you, you, you can run it at either one without any problem. Um, the next thing I want to show is the theta step size. This is the next one down. You can see on the, on the dialog box there, I'm, I'm showing these with, uh, with the little red uh, rectangle. Um, the theta step size defines the sampling frequency in Huff space, or basically how uh, coarse we're looking left to right in that Huff space. Um, the, the coarser the steps, the faster it goes. Uh, the finer the steps, the better detect detector detection precision. Um, and so here, one degree is sort of the default value. Again, if you're trying to, to make things a little more precise, you drop that number down and then check to see if your if your indexing results are, are improving a little bit. If you need it to go faster, you can you can go up a little bit. Uh, generally, the range goes from somewhere around a quarter of a degree to up to about three degrees for sampling. Uh, maximum band count. This is how many bands we want to try to find uh, in the Huff space. Uh, we generally don't try to find all the bands just because there's it's always hard to exactly say how many there are, and the, and the pattern quality can change as you go across the sample. Um, the, the number of bands we look for 
uh, directly affects the number of band triplets and therefore the number of votes available for indexing. Uh, and so generally uh, we use somewhere between seven and 10 for what I'd call higher symmetry materials, uh, cubic, hexagonal uh, type materials. 10 to 12 is common for sort of low symmetry, you know, monoclinic, triclinic type of materials to get enough uh, triplet combinations for, for good indexing. Those numbers vary very much by material and their simulation tools to sort of determine what's required for each of those. Those are just sort of rule of thumbs of where you want to where you want to be. And then one of the important ones that if we're thinking about changing the Huff transform uh, for specific phases would be to look at the convolution mask size. So the convolution mask is, is just an image processing step that we use to pass a filter over the Huff space to um, to enhance the shape of the peak in the Huff space. And I'll show you a slide after this. Uh, and it's just to make the bands stand out better for detection. So our default size is nine by nine, but we can go as low as I think three by three up to maybe 15 by 15. There's a range that goes lower to higher. And really the correlation is we use larger mask sizes when the bandwidth gets larger, wider. We use smaller mask as the bandwidth gets lower. Uh, and we also have the option to do two different paths. So you have a material that has both narrow and wide bands. You can do two-stage huffs to detect bands that way. It's important to know that the, um, that the bandwidth on the image will be affected both by the material you're looking at and also by your SEM voltage. As you, as you decrease your voltage, your bands get wider. As you increase your voltage, they get narrower. So you kind of look for a sweet spot between your operating conditions and your material and your mask size to get the best fit band detection. And this just shows here a little image looking at the raw Huff transform there on the top left. Um, the Huff peaks generally have a pretty characteristic shape of a of a little trough, a peak, and another trough. And so in the Huff space, that looks like a dark, light, dark region. And so when we pass this mask over that, we enhance the shape and the contrast of that peak in Huff space, which makes band detection uh, a little easier. The other feature uh, or the other setting that I like to play with uh, is the vertical bias setting. Um, this is just a little weighting feature that adjusts if we want to find things higher or lower on the phosphor screen. Uh, again, we know that different materials will um, give different intensities as a function of working distance. So if we have a, a multi-phase sample, um, you know, we can't necessarily optimize working distance for each phase as we're scanning. We'd have to, you know, move the sample or detector or something. That's just not what happens. But what we can do is now we can adjust the bias per phase uh, for re-indexing. So if we want to detect things higher, uh, on the phosphor screen, we increase the vertical bias. We want to detect lower, we decrease it. Zero is, of course, the default with no bias. So we can optimize band detection um, per phase um, through this approach. The, um, the other thing we're able to do is we can add new phases for re-indexing. So again, if we've, we've looked at our data set, we say, hey, I found a, a new phase in here and I want to add it, well, we can add that phase and then re-index uh, all the points or specific partitions um, to, to uh, figure out the orientations for just that phase. Um, we can also um, adjust our phase parameters to, um, um, to optimize the crystallography for um, four phases. So if we might find out we need to change the bands or the number of bands we're, we're having our reflector list, that can be done uh, through that. And so the, um, the other thing we're able to do when we talk about re-indexing is we can re-index points, partitions, or the entire data set. So that allows us to sort of focus our re-indexing efforts uh, we can also do what we call chi-scan, which I'll explain in a couple of slides. We also have the option um, to batch re-index, so we can re-index a, a number of different data sets as, as a batch. That's useful for if we have 3D data sets. And with that batch indexing, we can also do chi-scan, and we can also do NPAR as part of that re-indexing. As far as chi-scan, um, the important part of that is that for some materials, and this is an example from hematite, 
uh, and Ilmenite, that the patterns for a given phase um, will have the same look even though the chemistry is different. So it's difficult to differentiate these crystallographically by finding the, the position of these bands because the positions, as you can see here, between the, the two grains are the same. So we generally can use chemistry to tell the difference. So this just shows a, a phase map uh, between the uh, two phases without chi-scan, and we get a very noisy phase map. We just we can't differentiate these uh, reliably with EBSD. So by using chi-scan or chemical indexing scan to bring EDS can be helpful. So this just shows an example here. Of course, EBSD works well when crystal structures are different. Uh, this just shows an example of a hexagonal and a cubic phase. Those are easy for EBSD to tell them apart. EBSD will struggle when crystal graphic structures are, are similar. So this just shows examples of three cubes, three FCC cubes. Um, so the, the uh, atoms in that unit cell are in the same place. They scatter similarly, similar lattice parameters. So the patterns are very similar. If we look at the band positions, we can't uniquely differentiate the phases. Um, we can easily determine the orientation is just telling the phases apart. And so what we can do with this is we can use chemical information we can detect simultaneously with EBSD data to tell phases apart. So on the example we have here um, for these phases, we can see that there's an, uh, uh, a region that's iron rich uh, and a region that's uh, more titanium and no iron to help differentiate ilmenite from hematite. So ilmenite has titanium, uh, hematite is only iron and oxygen. And so we can use this information then to say at the points where we have uh, titanium, it should be ilmenite. The points where we don't should just be hematite. That drives our phase selection, and then we can determine the orientation. So this just shows, um, on the left, this shows that noisy EBSD phase map. The image here in the middle shows the chi-scan phase map using chemistry, so we get nice phase structure that matches the contrast we were seeing um, in the Prius and the backscatter detector images. And then we see the orientation map. So we see the orientations from those phases. And this is just an interesting example because the orientations of the phases actually have an orientation relationship. And that's why we see the two patterns look too so similar. Um, a couple of more applications I wanted to talk about that can be used, uh, that can use safe patterns. One is um, what's termed HR EBSD or high angular resolution EBSD. This is an approach to try to improve um, um, the, um, the angular precision of EBSD measurements and also to start thinking about elastic strain measurements. So the way this is done is what's called with the Wilkinson method developed by Angus Wilkinson at Oxford University. Uh, and so you have a reference pattern here shown on the left, uh, which is ideally strain free, um, but that's, that's uh, not always the case. Sometimes it's just your, your best guess at a reference pattern. Uh, and then we have an experimental pattern to the right that we're gonna compare the two. So in this case, it's just rotated two degrees um, so it's a very slight, uh, subtle shift. When we have these two different patterns, um, we select different regions uh, within the pattern. Uh, and so, you know, schematically here, we've shown what, nine different regions of interest, but that can go up to, you know, many more than that, 25, 30, 40. Uh, and between each different region, we compare the two looking for subtle shifts through a, a fast Fourier transform cross-correlation approach that allows us to detect uh, shifts at a sub-pixel level. And so if we look at all these then uh, region of interest shifts and compare them together, that allows us to then calculate uh, a dis displacement gradient tensor for the entire pattern. Once we have that tensor, um, that tensor can then be um, broken down into an elastic part, which is the symmetric part of the tensor, uh, and an asymmetric part, uh, which helps us uh, understand the rotations that are then associated with geometrically necessary dislocations in the material, um, stating, of course, that statistically stored dislocations are not determined by this method. And so when we do this, it's giving us a nice relative measure of, of the, um, of the, the uh, of the distortions and uh, 
displacements relative from our reference to our experimental pattern. And so this is just a really uh, a nice example from a paper that Angus and Ben Britton uh, put out a few years ago. This is looking at uh, an indent in single crystal silicon where you can see the um, the uh, strain and uh, distortion fields that, that are created by this indent. And we see that it can be broken down into the symmetric, the strain components, and the anti-symmetric rotation components uh, for material. And so, and for HR, ABSD, this is generally where you're going to save patterns and analyze them at, at, at sort of full pattern resolution. Uh, and then another application, which is uh, that's it's um, uh, kind of new to the EBSD field and, and seeing some interesting new applications, uh, is a different indexing approach called dictionary indexing. And so this is an, an indexing approach where we match an experimental pattern to a library or a set of simulated EBSD patterns for a given phase. Uh, and so um, this is a, a little bit slower because you do you simulate you know the, the the representative part of orientation space to build up this this dictionary of patterns. Uh, and so because we're doing this, it's done, typically done offline, not on, online. And this has been developed by uh, Mark DeGraff and his research group at, at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, and so, and, and then special thanks to Ferengus Ram for, for sharing some of her slides with me. And so this pattern here that we show on the left, the circular pattern is an experimental pattern. The pattern matrix on the right is a subset of all the simulated diffraction patterns uh, for this phase for all orientations. And we basically start comparing one to the other, looking for the best fit to determine the orientation. And where this is nice is as our patterns get noisy or lower quality, uh, our indexing rates start to improve. So this is looking at um, the camera. This matrix here at the top left is the, the top row here is the camera at very high gain, so very noisy. The column on the left shows huff indexing, so very poor indexing at high gain um, and, and low voltage. With the dictionary indexing, you see we actually get a very good representation of the structure. So as signal and noise increases, dictionary indexing works very well. And of course, uh, for us, this is work we did together with Mark and his group, uh, looking at dictionary indexing and NPAR on this sort of a, of a process. Um, and really, both work well. Indexing works, uh, or dictionary indexing works, you can see on this distribution, kind of gives the best results, uh, then NPAR, then traditional indexing. And so these alternative indexing approaches allows us to um, recover uh, data from saved patterns a lot better um, than just traditional indexing. It allows us to get more data out, especially as we push uh, systems either via speed or via acquisition conditions further than we want to. And so the ability within OIM analysis to selective re-index uh, allows us to target this re-indexing on areas where it's needed. If we can index things online fast with sufficient quality, we don't necessarily need to re-index them offline. We can only re-index the points that require re-indexing uh, to get a, a better overall data set. So with that, um, as, a, as a summary, um, I'd like to say it's easy to save the patterns. Uh, it's, it's the file, uh, the methodology is easy. It's not that much space. It's, it's, um, it's easy to get hard drives. The saved patterns can be reviewed in both team and OIM analysis software. Um, the re-indexing capabilities of the saved patterns allows for improved data quality through background adjustment, huff parameters, NPAR, and things like that. Um, there are new applications being developed based on the access to these patterns. And of course, thank you for, for your attention for this. Um, I'd like to also just make mention, uh, there are additional resources available from EDAX to help let you know of what's available. So um, we, of course, obviously have webinars, and these are available uh, after the fact. Oops, I went one forward. Let's see. Push to audio. Um, we have an EDAX blog where, uh, on a basically bi-weekly basis, we put out some new content that's usually pretty interesting and fun to read. Uh, we have our YouTube channel with different information. Um, Uh, and uh, so, and if there's a uh, need for additional information, here's our, our email address. And with that, I think I at least have time for uh, one or two quick questions. Um, 
And so I'm just going to do a quick review here uh, to see if I can find a couple. Um, and so one of the one of the first questions here is, can I use NPAR in Team? Um, the answer is yes. Um, the 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 the, the trade-off for that is uh, with team reprocessing, you're you're re-indexing all the patterns. Uh, whereas if you do it in OIM analysis, you can selectively apply NPAR to specific partitions. Um, find one more. About in an hour. Um, there's a question saying, is Prius is the Prius image built up from signal recorded on the EBSD pattern? Uh, yes, that's exactly what happens. It's built up by whatever signal is hitting the pattern, and but rather than looking at the entire signal uh, on the EBSD pattern, we can also break it up into different regions of interest to create multiple images uh, from the signal impacting the EBSD pattern. The, um, there's one more question here, uh, but it starts going into deformation by dislocation slip, and so that that one would probably take me a little bit longer to think about and a little bit longer to answer. So I'll I'll go ahead and answer that question offline, um, and so I, this will will uh, will follow shortly. So with that, um, we're at the one hour and one minute mark, so I'm going to go ahead and stop. Um, thank you for your attention. Uh, we appreciate you listening. Thank you very much.